I spent um, the days checking mm -hmm. all you mentioned last last class, and I checked mm -hmm. the video about the developing uh, an argument. Okay. And I found it very like. Helpful. Is that helpful? Kind of get yeah. some ideas about mm -hmm. organizing. Good. Also, I I check the my, para, my paragraph and I realize that the individual theory is kind of biased. Okay. So I think I changed the outline, like the structure of the paragraph. Okay. Have you updated uh, this page? Yesterday. Okay. Yesterday after. Uh, you made some comments, I updated. Ah, okay. The only thing that I would uh, say with uh -huh. regard to step one is um, do your best to follow that prompt mm -hmm. where it begins by saying, I wish to learn more about something, the topic, because I want to find out whatever. And then you mm -hmm. fill in the blank, in order to. So it has those three phrases. Um, and then you insert those three parts. Yes. All right. So um, I would I would just do that because, and I, I say this because uh -huh. the second section where it says because I want to find out that second section is basically the um, where you're going to derive your research questions from. That yes. is the question. So I want to make that really clear. I want that to be clear for you. Um, whenever you're developing your research questions that you look at that mm -hmm. phrase that section and you and you take and develop your own research questions from that so right now you have I wish to learn more about the impact of different mediation types in using literary literature circles with English proficiency students um, the first section I wish to learn more about can be very general that is the topic and that can be general. What needs to be more specific is when you start, because I want to find out, and then you think of some of the question words, how teachers do this, or how students do this, why teachers do this, why students do this, when do teachers do this, when do students feel this, or, you know, so think of behaviors, what do they do, and attitudes or perceptions, how do they feel, what opinions do they have, and this second section here too is also very much aligned with step two mm -hmm. where you ask yourself what am I going to examine well whatever you examine is coming directly from those research questions mm -hmm. right it's going to tell you okay I need to examine these things in order to answer my research questions that's why again this prompt I think is helpful especially narrowing down precisely what the research problem is, what you want to mm -hmm. res research. So um, whenever you talk about, I wish to examine student opinions, emotions, environmental context, all right. Um, now when you say environmental context, again, the idea is trying to be as, as specific as possible. So I want to examine, um, I want to examine how students, okay, so students' opinions, okay, about about participating in uh, literature circles uh, or how they feel, their emotions about that. But you also uh, perhaps want to examine what they, um, the language that they use to determine the roles maybe. I don't know if you're focusing on how they determine uh, the, the roles for uh -huh. the literature circles or if the teacher is going to determine that yes, role. Uh, I, I was like thinking on that. And mm -hmm. I realized that on ma mediation, that is part of the social cultural theory, mm -hmm. there is uh, the different, I forget the exact word. Um, the speech, the private speech, mm -hmm. because the students okay. are ha have like a proficient level. Mm -hmm. So they are like they have a private speech that they don't show, but it's it's in the interaction. Okay. And I want to relate that to the activity theory. Uh, last 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 tutoring we were like 
Uh, you asked me which of the three generations of the activity theory I want to focus on. Yes. And I think it's very related uh, to the third generation. Okay. Because they have to find like a they have to agree to communicate, mm -hmm. they have to share the same language or they have to share the same vocabulary, so mm -hmm. that's it, fine. it matches. Okay. It matches. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fine. Yeah, you if you think that's the most appropriate then mm -hmm. make just make sure that you uh, discuss that. Um, I'm looking here about private speech, mm -hmm. and if you want to, you have to ask yourself how you're going to measure private speech. I mean, if that's going to, if that's going to be the focus, if you're focusing on uh, the private speech, mm -hmm. um, you need to find out how you want to measure that. Maybe, maybe. I don't want to measure the private speech, but I want to measure the the language they use. Okay. Um, when they have like this kind of circle, okay. And the the language they use to to talk to each other, like. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So um, so then maybe you're gonna focus. On, uh, I'm going to jump now to the unit of analysis. Uh -huh. Now, the unit of analysis you're mentioning here, teacher practices, it might also be the unit of analysis group work. If you're, because I'm assuming you're only going to focus on one or two or three groups. Two Big, groups. Okay, two groups. So, but two groups. When I say group, so are we talking about a class as a group or a group within a class? That's uh, something I didn't consider. Okay. Because, for example, I'm assuming the literature circles consist of like four or five students, students right? So if you're going to measure that to focus, focus on, a on, a, on a group of four or five, like a... a the, the unit of analysis would be a literature circle. Mm -hmm. So that literature circle could be from one class, mm -hmm. or it could be from two different classes, it could be two groups, but, but the group itself would not be the entire class, it would be the group the same of four or five. So mm -hmm. for example, if you wanted to look at two different teachers using yeah. literature circles, you could focus. You could ask each teacher and say, "Okay, which of your groups are the be quote unquote best or the interact the best?" And focus on one of those groups from each class, mm -hmm. right? Or same teacher, same class, one class, but two or three groups within that one class. Mm -hmm. But you th later you can determine that. But you do need to be thinking about, okay, in this case, what is the unit of analysis, probably uh, the literature circle, the group of four or five students, and then you are looking at what the teacher, how the teacher interacts with that one group, not necessarily the entire class, depends. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. at least it's clear on what the teacher is saying to that one group and how that's, that group is reacting, mm -hmm. right? Because you can measure that one group. It would be very difficult to measure all the groups Perhaps you know because you have to record. You probably no, have to record. It's, and it's, it's quite difficult. complicated, right? So Even mm -hmm. last semester I just choose chose like um, four students mm -hmm. from the group and I assigned the roles, and it was much easier to measure. And you can focus on one group, one literature circle, one mm -hmm. class, one teacher, and within that class, one group of four or five students who are, who are participating in their own literature circle, but you're going to have a lot of data about language. You're going to have to record and do a discourse analysis both within the students themselves mm -hmm. and within the teacher mm -hmm. to, to look about, to look at mediation, what, how is their behaviors being mediated by language that mm -hmm. is roles and yeah, all of that. So. Yeah, like the things in which they agree 
because each one has like a different <laughs> goal even there on the same class. I would prefer, so. I, I, my suggestion at this point would be to focus I think on one group mm -hmm. and really get as much information and, and investigate as much as possible that dynamic of mediation. Uh, How many times do I have to observe the group? Well, it depends on how uh, how long the literature circle activity lasts. Like, I mean, you're going to have to either do an intervention or find a teacher who's already doing literature circles. Mm -hmm. Probably you're going to have to do an intervention, I'm assuming, because I'm not sure how yeah. many teachers already no, do. If you find some, great. But um, you're probably going to have to do an intervention. And then you're going to have to plan, okay, I have two or three weeks of data collection. Uh, can we plan, I don't know, two activities or three literature circle activities? You have to plan ahead with the teacher and say, okay, what is doable? How long, more or less, is this literature circle going to take? Mm -hmm. And then try to plan work very closely with the teacher to make sure you get as much information because you don't want to inconvenience the teacher also. So you don't want this activity, this, this research, to interfere with the goals of the course. Hopefully, the activity itself will, will be in line with the goals of the course mm -hmm. and they'll be willing to do it. But, um, yeah, you're going to, I'm assuming uh, one literature circle lasts how long? A, a lesson? Two lessons? I really don't know. One lesson. Okay, so let's say less, a lesson. At least like half an hour. Well, students, well, in, that, in the previous semester, I let the students to read to write individually the the, arti the article we how you say we communicate mm -hmm. we discuss and they just arrive and they talk about the the roles so only that part took like half of an hour okay so if you're allowing time to read in class well then maybe don't count that time because they're just reading right mm -hmm. you, what you want is the time that they're actually interacting, right? And maybe before where they're determining uh, roles. So whether the teacher is saying these are your roles or within the group they determine their roles, okay? Then you, maybe you have one activity where the teacher dictates who the roles, what roles each student's going to take, and then maybe another activity uh, later the next week where the students themselves, different reading, but the students determine the roles, and you record that planning process where they ask each other, okay, who's going to be the questioner? Who's going to uh, be the summarizer? And so that would be also part of your data analysis. And then you could interview and find out, okay, what were you thinking here? Why did you determine these roles? Mm -hmm. All that. All right, so... Um, so I think that the unit of analysis, I think in this case, would be the literature circle, mm -hmm. right? And within the literature circle, you're going to be, as we've talked about, you'll be analyzing all the language, doing a discourse analysis, transcribing what they said, and analyzing the language, mm -hmm. right? And so I would look, take another look at step two, just to be a little bit more specific there and reword step one to include those three parts of the prompt that I mentioned here in red. And uh, you should be fine. Which part? Uh, I added this text this morning, just a note, uh, basically what we're talking about today, to add this prompt. I wish to learn more about, and then because I want to find out X in order to whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, just to, to use to include these three parts of the prompt in your step one up here. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Mm. Questions about yes, the step? Yes, a lot of questions. Alrighty. Um, well, the thesis statement has to be like an argumentative statement, right? All right, think of um, it, when you reviewed uh, how to form an argument, uh, one of the main things, one of the main ideas here is that you're going to be creating with what we call claims. Uh -huh. Now, 
All right. And I list here different types of claims, okay? Mm -hmm. But essentially, the thesis statement is the one big claim, the idea that is the main idea of your literature review and your thesis document, okay? Now, this thesis statement occurs in the introduction, so you're going to be beginning talking about the purpose of your research and a little bit of background to the problem, and you're going to finish your 250 or to 350 word uh, introduction with one sentence, and that is your thesis statement, the, the main idea of your literature review. Now that is called a claim. That's a it's it's a position. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to propose something. It's one sentence to claim. Now, the rest of your thesis statement is going to be to support your thesis statement. You're going to be elaborating, forming an argument, a position on that. So, a topic sentence is also a claim. Mm -hmm. But now the, this claim is a more specific idea. Okay, it's not the general idea. It's a it's one, in this case, one idea that uh, uh, supports the thesis statement. Mm -hmm. So your, all of your organization is made up of claims. And at a very basic level, you have the thesis statement. Okay? Mm -hmm. Within the thesis statement, you may have, let's say, two or three main sections. Those main sections are sub-ideas, right? Smaller ideas that support the thesis statement. Within each of those main two or three sections, you're going to have paragraphs that have individual ideas, topic sentences, claims mm -hmm. that support. Right. So it's all about organizing those claims, those ideas around your argument. Think of it almost like a type of persuasive essay mm -hmm. where you have a claim, you have one position, and then you have a you have a claim and you have a counterclaim. Mm -hmm. So whatever the position that you take, whatever you say, this strategy or this concept uh, is, applies here. There's always another counter counter, counter argument or claim where others disagree, mm -hmm. or that there's some hole in your idea that it's just there's never it's never just all one-sided one -sided. right mm -hmm. so the idea here is to try your best to include uh, research citations references that support your claims but from both from two different perspectives mm -hmm. I mean you all, you have one main claim that mm -hmm. you still think is the best yes you're gonna propose a counterclaim saying well there's another side of this it's not perfect but you always come back and say, but this is still the best way because of this. It so can be, for example, first the counterpart and then the refusal. You can, yeah, there are different ways. The, 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 the most quote-unquote normal way of doing it is state the claim, state the counterclaim, and then the rebuttals or the, the, the final uh, <laughs> first claim again saying why the counterclaim is, is not as good. Mm -hmm. That's the normal way. But there, there's nothing wrong. I mean, if you have, to, depending on the, the the topic, you might just come out and state the counterclaim, the negative, mm -hmm. the weakness, and then follow up with with uh, the main claim or support. I, I have just like depends. an idea. Uh, first of all, I want to start with the behavior theory because I think it's very strong, and as the counterpart. And then the sociocultural theory that is pretty much like okay. <coughs> completely different. And in the sociocultural theory, I would like to continue with the activity theory. Okay. Then uh, I would take the the generation of the activity theory. Then link it to the mediation and the private speech. Okay. Uh, All right. Now, uh, in in general, I, that's I like that organization. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing I would look at again is private speech, because usually private speech and and mediation is very much part of social culture, like social cultural uh -huh. theory. Uh, so if you present that at the end after activity theory, and then usually activity theory uh -huh. comes after social cultural theory. Uh -huh. So. Just ask yourself if, if mediation or private speech should be first also included within social cultural theory. 
If you see relevance later in activity theory uh, with regard to private speech, mm -hmm. you can mention private speech again. There's nothing wrong with saying private speech originally maybe comes from social culture theory. Then whenever you talk about activity theory and you want to talk about the relevance of private speech in activity theory, mention again. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's, that's the way to do it because <laughs> You're saying, you know, you're because if if you if you don't mention private speech and social cultural theory, then there might be a gap mm -hmm. there because they may some the reader may say, well, isn't private speech speech also part of social cultural theory? So you might want to say private speech relates to social cultural theory like this, and then when you talk about activity theory, private speech, the relationship with private speech and is. Uh, with regard to activity theory is like this. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a little bit different, it's a different perspective, mm -hmm. which is good. But it's different because you've already mentioned private speech and social cultural theory. See what I mean? Mm, so yeah. Let, let me sure. explain okay. if you can if I got the your idea. All okay. Right. The social cultural theory, then activity theory, and I continue with mediation, include that Mm, private speech, and I can go back, including the the third generation of the activity theory. All right, look at it like dividing it up, maybe into three sections, uh -huh. three main sections. Something uh -huh. about behavioral theory, uh -huh. okay. The second, social cultural theory. Uh -huh. Third, activity. Uh -huh. now, those are the three main. Perhaps, you know, as an option. Uh -huh. There's three main sections. <coughs> now, within social cultural theory, you might mention mediation, private speech, because those terms are very much associated with social cultural theory. And then in the next section, mm -hmm. you're talking about activity theory, you talk about activity theory, and then you mention again mediation as a sub you know, idea. Oh, it's within theory. that third uh -huh. activity theory. You bring up private speech again and mediation again, but maybe from a different perspective. Now, from the perspective of activity theory, uh -huh. not so much social cultural theory. So, uh -huh. what I'm talking about is incorporating or using, including these topics, like subtopics, into these bigger, broad topics of activity so, theory. Yeah. And I'm sorry, uh, social cultural theory, then activity theory. Does that make sense? To make it like very strong. Yeah. So you can talk about the similar ideas in each of those two or three main sections, uh, but maybe they apply differently, or maybe they're completely different mm -hmm. topics or you know uh, notions. But um, that's that's what I would recommend. That kind of break it down into to those sections now. In each of those sections, activity theory, you're going to come up with a little uh, uh, more specific claims that build on social cultural theory. So you look at social cultural theory, ask yourself, how do I want to form an argument around social cultural theory? How do I want to form an argument around activity theory? How do I want to form an argument around behavioral theory? Right, and so then you break it down in, into those sections, and you say, okay, what is the first body paragraph? What's the main, for the first claim or the first topic sentence, and, and then organize it. It's almost like a mini essay within each of those sections, uh -huh. right? And that's that's what we want. So it's first, it's like thesis statement, the three sections, one, two, and three. Now within each of those three sections. Mm -hmm. You break it down again. Okay, uh -huh. how do I want to form an argument? Everything that's related uh -huh. here now apply it to each of those three main sections. And after that, after the activity theory, I plan the com uh, uh, include the community of practice and literature circles. Okay. Is it too big? All right. Like, well, uh, ask yourself if if it if it's if it warrants uh, another section. If you need a fourth section or if you talk about literature circles within the context of those three. I can do it like that. We can do it in, I mean, what we're looking <laughs> at is a logical order. So for example, mm -hmm. first se section, behavioral theory. Mm -hmm. You talk about the theory, blah, 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 blah. And then you talk about literature circles within the context of 
behavioral theory. Then you move on to social cultural theory. You talk about the main concepts, you form an argument, and at the end, you form, you describe the applicability or how does this relate to literature circles. Then you mm -hmm. go into activity theory. You talk about the theory, and you finish mm -hmm. with talking about the relationship literature circles has with regard to activity theory. Mm -hmm. So notice, you're following the same pattern mm -hmm. and, and trying to find a logical pattern. Uh -huh. So you're, think, you're saying in each section, theory uh -huh. and practice. Next section, theory and practice. Section mm -hmm. three, theory and practice, in the sense that theory are the key concepts and the practice is, in this case, literature circles. Mm -hmm. How, what's the relationship here, the pluses and minuses, the good and the bad, with each of those three with regard to literature circles? Mm -hmm. See, Because what you're, you're proposing is the benefit of doing literature circles or using literature circles uh, from these theoretical and ideas. And give the students the opportunity to choose because they are like prepared to uh, get together and mm -hmm. choose their right. roles. So this way, if you are doing it this way, you're really connecting very closely the idea of literature circles with each of those three. Okay. Now that's one way of doing mm -hmm. it. Okay. Um, there's always, there's many ways of doing it. Another way mm -hmm. is if you feel, you know, that um, you want. Let's say that you say, well, I don't have a lot to say about literature circles for any one of those three, or, mm -hmm. or you know. So maybe you have at the end a section where you talk about as much as you can from those theories that apply the most to literature circles. You develop a fourth section. Mm -hmm. hey, doesn't you know, whatever you think makes more sense. I, I I have like a lot of annotated bibliographies, and I don't have the behavioral theory even now. And I was thinking like it's too much information and I don't know how to yeah and it. think about this we don't you're only dealing here uh, let's do let's get a calculator out here like 14 days <laughs> well not so much the time frame but what I'm referring to are the number of words in each section so your literature review is going to be approximately 2,500 words right uh -huh. all right we have to subtract out let's say 250 words for the introduction right so uh -huh. that leaves 2,250 words for those three set in this case three or four mm -hmm. sections yes let's say you divide it up into three sections mm -hmm. so divided by three is 750 words all right 750 words if you divide up to 2250 and divide that into four sections that gets us down to 500 word approximately 500 mm -hmm. words 562 words which is about two pages Okay, certainly that's that's a possibility if each of those four sections is more or less the same. But what happens if you have one section that is 800 words that you say, oh, I just really need to have this information. I have one section that's 800 words. That's going to cut your you know, 300 word this last section by 300 words. It's only going to leave maybe 250 words, and then you ask yourself, well. I have 250 words, one section for 250 words. That's like one page. That's cutting it pretty close. And the idea here, what we want to avoid is to have a section that doesn't have much text. Because mm -hmm. these are main sections. These are headings. Okay. Uh -huh. When I say main sections, I'm talking a level two heading. Mm -hmm. A level two heading all the way to the left on its own line. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what you have to kind of ask yourself. Okay, do I have more or less the same information for those four? Fine, maybe four uh, sections would work. But let's say you say, well, no, I really, I have a lot more. One section is going to be a lot more. Then ask yourself, well, maybe I'd be better off coming up with three sections. Okay. All right. Mm, what else? In, well, I add the headline of the paragraph, but I don't know if it is correct in the thesis. Uh, sorry, it's not yours.
And also, I couldn't uh, adapt the. You know that on the first page you have running head. Yes. And on the other ones you don't have to. But I don't know how. Well, to no, adjust. you should have it on every page. The running head. But not the the word running head and the column, right? Ah, uh, okay. Well, later we'll work that out. There's a like there's a um, I'm not sure in Google Drive how to do that in Microsoft Word. You can. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll have to look at that. You can do work in sections, and I know what you mean. A uh, running head though will be in all uppercase, uh -huh. okay? And and how you have it set up here is fine also. The uh -huh. page number up here and not doing a page uh -huh. number at the bottom. So uh -huh. I set it up the other way, but this is perfectly fine. Okay. The only thing I would do here is just include the first five words or so. One, two, three, four, five maybe till classes and delete the rest to bring up the page number up. right so I would just do this okay you don't have to include the entire heading if you have a really long heading and then this way you can uh, bring this up over I see and that's it oops yeah and maybe go back later and change the font here. This font looks different than Times New Roman, uh -huh. but that's the idea. And I would set a separate, add a space between this, and it's not in bold, uh -huh. and center it. So maybe bring this down just a little bit to the uh -huh. center of the page. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Uh, what are, what are the question did you have? At the bottom. Bottom. Oh no no no. Questions about the... Oh, I don't know if you had a question about this. No, the question uh, was how to eliminate running head from the second and uh, the rest of the, of the pages. For now, just leave it the way it is. Okay. okay, okay. Yeah, it's fine. We'll, we'll work with the ending formats uh, later on. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think I don't have any other doubts. Okay, so take another look at your literature review when you've made the changes and they have the sections the way you want, mm -hmm. um, and you want me to look at it. Let me let me know. And yes. um, like for instance, here the individual. And maybe you haven't had a chance to look at made the changes, but this is one thing that I would try to avoid is having a heading or header. Uh -huh. Sorry, heading, and only have one paragraph of text. Yeah, that, that, that was the ones that I told, you told me that look for the author and it was very difficult to find. Okay. So right. I decided to eliminate like a whole paragraph because okay. he's biased. All right. Okay. So yeah, I think got a good start here. Um, okay. And um, I add maybe a page break here. Mm -hmm. Page break is Control Enter. Control Enter. Yeah, I think it's like Microsoft Word. You can and you can Comments. also click Insert Page Break. Page Break. Uh huh. So references will have page breaks, and in each individual appendix will also have a page break. <coughs> Which are the commands for? The page I think it's Control Enter. Um, I'm on a Mac, and you can also click mm -hmm. Insert Page Break. And uh, if you're on a PC, it should tell you also. I, I think it's Control Enter on a PC, and uh -huh. a, on a Mac, I think it's Command Enter. But you can also manually do it by clicking Insert Page Break here. Okay. Everything else looks okay here. The, the formats. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. You're <laughs> welcome. And we'll see you next week. Uh, if you need anything, send me an email on Canvas and I'll take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Nice.